You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. My name is Shalma, and I'm a PhD student at NYU. And I'm Dan Hooper. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist at Fermilab and at the University of Chicago. Okay, so I was snooping around on YouTube a bit, and I found a video of Dan Hooper recorded in 2007, and in it, he's making some pretty bold predictions about the future of dark matter detection, so I'm going to show him the video and see if he remembers it. All right. All right, what's the date? It's May 12, 2007. <laughs> I'm Dan Hooper, this is what's going to happen in the hunt for dark matter. Oh my. <laughs> In 2009, or perhaps 2010, the LAC will detect missing energy signals that they can conclusively say corresponds to a missing energy, uh, to a, a neutral, uh, long-lived particle. All right, it was quite a... So, all right, it was something like 10 or 15 years ago, I was at this barbecue with some friends of mine, uh, a couple friends that I went to grad school with. Uh, one of them is Steve Sekula. He made the video, and uh, at his barbecue, after a few beers, I started to make some, let's say, rather bold predictions for when we would figure out what dark matter is. So how are you feeling about your predictions now? <laughs> they didn't pan out very well. I was pretty optimistic, honestly, that in that you know several year window, we'd find out what the dark matter was made of. And have we? No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 2020 and we still haven't detected dark matter. But that's not because of a lack of great ideas or great experiments. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about the dark matter candidates and dark matter experiments that have dominated these past couple of years. So if you don't know much about dark matter, here are the basics. We now know that the universe is filled with some kind of invisible matter, which we call dark matter. The gravity of this matter is what keeps our galaxies held together, and it played a really heavy hand in how our universe ended up looking as clumpy as it does now, with regions of densely packed stars and galaxies next to open regions of empty space. And there's more dark matter in the universe than there is normal matter. In fact, 85% of the matter in the universe today is dark matter, where that other 15% includes every kind of visible matter that we know about. Electrons, protons, neutrons, antimatter... We actually did a past episode exploring the early evidence for dark matter, so if you're interested in learning more about that, the episode is called, Why Are We So Sure About Dark Matter? So in the beginning, when all of this evidence for dark matter was first flowing in, people thought that maybe it could be explained by low luminosity objects in space that we know about. Things like black holes, neutron stars, planets, and other remnants of dead stars which don't give off much light. We call this category of objects machos, which stands for Massive Compact Halo Objects. And while machos were once a good idea for what the dark matter could be, they're now ruled out by gravitational microlensing and cosmological measurements, so machos can't make up most of the dark matter. So now, most physicists think that the dark matter has to be made up of some kind of new particle, a particle that may not even be in our standard model of particle physics. So here's what we know about what this particle would be like. First of all, this particle must have some significant mass that contributes to the gravity of the dark matter and must not move very close to the speed of light. In other words, the dark matter must be what we call cold. And secondly, since the dark matter doesn't interact with light, it can't have any charge. Yeah, anything out there with substantial electric charge or what we call QCD color, which is the thing, the charge that allows you to feel the strong force, those things uh, would be pretty easy to detect. So since we can't detect dark matter particles, or at least haven't so far, we are pretty confident, with a couple of small caveats here and there, that what, whatever the dark matter is doesn't carry electromagnetic charge, and it doesn't feel the effects of the strong nuclear force. Particles that satisfy these conditions are called WIMPs, which stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particles. And today, WIMPs describe the most studied class of dark matter candidates. So the first thing physicists did was to look at every single kind of particle that we knew about and ask which of these particles could satisfy these conditions to be a WIMP. And there was exactly one kind of particle that fit all those criteria, 
And that's a, what we call the neutrinos. There are actually three kinds of neutrinos, but they're all pretty similar. These are pretty light particles. They travel nearly the speed of light in experiments we've observed. Um, they don't have an electric charge. They don't feel the strong force. They do feel the weak nuclear force. And like all forms of matter and energy, they feel the force of gravity. And what's nice about neutrinos as a dark matter candidate is that we already know that they exist, and we know that there's lots of it in the universe. For example, like the neutrinos that are produced by the sun and in the atmosphere of the Earth um, are so abundant that something like uh, 10 to the 11 of them go through your body every second. So th th there are neutrinos everywhere. There's plenty of neutrinos, um, or so we thought. Um, but in order for them to make up enough mass to constitute the dark matter, it would turn out that we'd have to have them have a mass of around 10 electron volts. That's a pretty small mass. It's a lot smaller than the proton or the electron or other particles we know about. Um, but as the years went on, we measured these masses more and more. And we also learned things about how the halos of galaxies form and how heavy these particles have to be and things like this. And over time, it became very clear that neutrinos can't do the job. Uh, neutrinos have masses in the ballpark of a 0.1 electron volt, so 1% of the number you needed. And also, this would they would act as hot dark matter, screwing up the pattern of galaxies and galaxy clusters we observe. But using what physicists learned by studying neutrinos, they figure that maybe the dark matter could be explained by something like a neutrino, just heavier. And it just so happened that there was an extremely popular theory at the time that predicted a particle just like that. That theory is called supersymmetry. Basically, every particle in the universe falls into one of two categories. It's either a boson or a fermion, depending on its internal angular momentum. Fermions include particles like the electron and quarks, while bosons include things like photons and gluons and the Higgs. Supersymmetry posits that there is a kind of fun foundational or fundamental relationship between fermions and bosons. In particular, they say that for every fermion, there exists a boson with all the same quantum properties. So the electron, which is a fermion, would have a super part particle or super partner called a selectron or super electron, which was a boson. The same kind of electric charge, same kind of characteristics, probably a different mass, but um, otherwise the same sort of object. Photons would have photinos, and so on and so on. So the whole standard model of particles that we know and discovered would have a supersymmetric copy with uh, different kinds of angular momentum or spins. Supersymmetry became a really popular theory because it solved some outstanding particle physics problems really elegantly and also had this quality of mathematical beauty to it that people appreciated. And while it wasn't designed for it, a dark matter candidate just happened to fall out of it really nicely. In most versions of supersymmetry that are experimentally viable, it turns out that the lightest supersymmetric particle is stable through something called R parity. So whatever the lightest of these new particles is, if it doesn't have electric charge and doesn't feel the strong force, could be a dark matter candidate. And over the years, people have talked about neutrinos as dark matter candidates and gravitinos, the superpartner of the graviton, and also the superpartners of the photon Higgs boson, uh, Z boson, and all of those three would kind of mix together into a combination of particles that we call neutralinos. And those neutralinos make really good candidates for WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles. They're kind of like a neutrino-like particle, but heavier and, and frankly, a more viable candidate than neutrinos ever were. So not only are WIMPs, like neutralinos, good dark matter candidates because of their particle properties, but if you think about how these particles would have been created in the early universe, it turns out that it's really easy to match that on to how much dark matter we see in the universe today. So in the early universe, I'm, and I'm talking about really early here, this is like a billionth or a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, the whole universe would have been filled with a hot plasma of quarks and gluons, and all the super particles would, have, would be, or whatever wimps you're talking about really, would have been present in that thermal bath. And as the universe expand and cooled, eventually those particles would stop interacting and, and undergo something we call freeze out. And it turns out that particles like WIMPs, including neutralinos, undergo this process in such a way that gives you just about the right amount of particles in the universe today to account for all the dark matter. So cosmologists like me looked at this, you know, 
more than a decade ago and said, wow, this is, is really remarkable. Um, this theory we liked for a bunch of other reasons kind of automatically makes dark matter fall out in the uh, right, you know, the kind of abundance that you need to explain all these astrophysical observations. Uh, we were so enamored with it, we started calling it the, the wimp miracle, which is kind of an embarrassing phrase now. It doesn't seem that miraculous. But at the time, it seemed very, very compelling. So 10 or 20 years ago, most physicists were really enamored with supersymmetry and really thought that it could be true. It just was so convenient and would answer so many questions about the universe all at once. But since then, we haven't seen it in any experiments like the Large Hadron Collider where people expected to see results. And so faith in the theory is dying down a little bit. Maybe supersymmetry is still the right answer. I'm certainly not in a position to rule that out. Um, but I think it was a pretty rational response to the data for the physics community to become a lot less enthusiastic about supersymmetry as this data came in. So moving on from supersymmetry, there are lots of other dark matter candidates that are still very viable. One other dark matter candidate is called the sterile neutrino. This would be a new kind of neutrino, but one that doesn't feel the weak force. Um, this goes back to a paper in 1994 by Scott Dodelson, uh, my former colleague at Fermilab. He's at uh, Carnegie Mellon now, and uh, Larry Widrow. Um, they proposed that these sterile neutrinos, these neutrinos that don't feel the weak force, could have been produced in the early universe by spontaneous oscillations or transformations between active and sterile neutrinos. Um, and it turns out this works pretty well if those sterile neutrinos have masses in the kiloelectron volt sort of mass range. So this is this is pretty light compared to most of the particles we know of. An electron is 511 k, uh, kiloelectron volts of mass. So this is um, you know, significantly lighter than that, but much heavier than the other neutrinos. One way that you can look for these is that these neutrinos will occasionally decay. Um, and when they do, they can produce a very distinctive spectral line, photons with a very specific energy. And you can look for those lines using x-ray telescopes. So far, we haven't found any compelling evidence that we are actually observing such a line. Um, there, there for a while was a lot of excitement about a three and a half kV line that might have something to do with this, but I think that, you know, that the evidence is stacking up against that at this point. And the models have had to get more complicated over the years to uh, be consistent with a bunch of uh, observations, including those x-ray telescopes. Um, but there's still some chance that serial neutrinos might make up all or some of the dark matter. And WIMPs aren't the only class of dark matter candidates. Of non-WIMP dark matter candidates, the most popular one is something called the axion. This is a theoretical particle that falls out of a proposed solution to something called the strong CP problem in particle physics. And it doesn't stop there. There are also just a lot of other ideas that we're not going to talk about today about what the dark matter might be made of. I used to write a lot of papers about dark matter in the form of Kluge-Klein states. So these are particles traveling through extra dimensions of space. That's definitely something I want to talk about in a future episode. Um, we, you know, there, the list goes on and on and on. There are probably hundreds of different dark matter candidates that have appeared in the literature over the years. A lot of them are perfectly viable and possible. Um, like one thing I work on a lot now and, and you and I have worked on together is the possibility that dark matter might be part of something we call a hidden sector. These would be whole theories of particles all interacting among themselves, but that don't appreciably interact with any of the known forms of matter or energy. Uh, these hidden sectors have a lot of rich phenomenology or, or a, lot of, a lot of rich uh, feet, you know, behaviors to study. They, they lead to a lot of interesting potential observations and effects. So um, it's kind of a physicist's playground to uh, wander through the hidden sector space. So now we're going to talk about all the experiments that we've built to try to detect dark matter. And most of these experiments are aimed at detecting WIMPs. So yeah, the, the dark matter searches have focused on WIMPs, I would say for like two different kinds of reasons. One is because we find WIMPs to be really compelling, so we put a lot of our resources towards looking for them. But on the other hand, like we're looking for them because, in a sense, they're under the lamppost. Um, you know, the, in the famous story, you come across somebody standing under a lamppost in the dark, and they're looking for their keys, and they have no reason to think the keys are under the lamppost. That's just where they're looking because that's where the light is. 
So sometimes physicists have to look under the lamppost because it's just too hard to look anywhere else. So maybe hidden sector particles, for example, might be really compelling, but wow, they're hard to test. So we are going to go and instead look for the thing that might be easiest to test. There are three ways that WIMPs would interact with the normal matter in the universe. And so there are three types of experiments that we have to look for each of these kinds of interactions. So the first way that WIMPs could interact with normal matter is through scattering. So maybe a dark matter particle hits the nucleus of an atom and scatters in the other direction. And to detect these kinds of interactions, we build something called a direct detection experiment. So the WIMPs that are traveling around through the halo of the Milky Way are, are moving around pretty quick. I mean, they're slow compared to the speed of light, but they're going a few hundred kilometers per second. So very fast by, you know, kind of our day-to-day our, our, our -day experience. And when these hit a nucleus, they can impart quite a bit of momentum, you know, kill electron volts or even hundreds of kill electron volts of momentum. And that's enough to produce a bunch of signals in a carefully designed detector. You can see uh, scintillation light produced. You can see, uh, you can detect the phonons, which are really just the quantum of heat in these sorts of systems. Um, you can, they can liberate charge, which you can detect. So all these sorts of things are, 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 are being looked for. Some of the detectors are, are crystals of things like germanium and silicon kept at ultra cold temperatures, very close to absolute zero. Other detectors use uh, liquid vats of, of noble elements like xenon and, and others. Um, they're all buried deep in underground mines where they can be insulated from cosmic radiation. Um, if they're to be successful, they have to be very sensitive to even very small impacts. They have to be really protected from other sources of background so you can tell for sure when this sort of thing happens. And these days they have to be big. Modern detectors are multiple tons and uh, really difficult to instrument. It's a, a quite a, a striking engineering feat. Probably the single most important direct detection experiments in operation today are, are the, the xenon-based detectors. Here I have in mind experiments like Lux and their successor LZ, which is under construction right now at the Homestake Mine in South Dakota. There's also the xenon one ton experiment, which is being upgraded to xenon n ton right now in the Grand Sasso laboratory in Italy. Um, these and others are, are multiple tons of liquid xenon. Um, they're, they're, they're providing some of the strongest constraints on dark matter right now. Even when detectors don't actually detect dark matter, they still help us learn more about what dark matter could be. And that's because if we have a detector with a known sensitivity, and we know that that detector hasn't seen dark matter, then we know that the interaction rate between dark matter and xenon, for example, can't be that high and we get constraints on what this interaction rate can be. So we can rule out dark matter models that don't work. Over the last 15 years or so, these experiments have grown in sensitivity at an exponential rate, doubling um, in, in, in their sensitivity every year or so. This is faster than Moore's law for computing speed. So this has been like kind of the golden era in direct detection, just getting faster and better and better, um, sensitive to more and more dark matter candidates. Sure, they haven't seen anything, but you can't blame the experiments for that. They have outperformed any reasonable expectations. So now we can move on to the second way that WIMPs interact with normal matter, and that's through pair annihilation. So individual WIMPs have to be stable because they're still around in the universe today. There isn't appreciably smaller amounts of dark matter today than there was any number of billions of years ago. So we know they're stable, but when you take pairs of dark matter particles together. In a lot of theories, it's predicted that they can annihilate or destroy each other, converting their mass into other forms of energy that we might be able to see. Um, this is the same idea that an electron might be stable on its own, but you combine it with a positron and they can annihilate, giving you things like photons. So we're looking for the analogous process when pairs of WIMPs annihilate each other. These sorts of WIMP annihilations can produce things like gamma rays, uh, high energy photons. They can produce um, cosmic ray antimatter like positrons and antiprotons and even things like antideuterons or antihelium nuclei. Um, they could produce neutrinos and antineutrinos. And we're looking for all of these sorts of things using a variety of different kinds of telescopes and, and, and observatories. 
So experiments that try to detect the annihilation products of dark matter are called indirect detection experiments, in contrast to the direct detection experiments that we talked about before. One of the most powerful ways we have to, to look for WIMP annihilations is the impact it would have on the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background gives us a pristine picture of what our universe was like a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. If WIMPs were annihilating an appreciable rate back then, the electromagnetic energy in the form of electrons and photons and things that would have been deposited in the universe uh, would have potentially screwed up that pristine picture in a way that we could measure and observe today. Um, from this, we can deduce that most kinds of WIMPs that are, you know, in order to be consistent with what we observe in the CMB, they would have to be heavier than 10 or 20 giga electron volts or roughly 10 or 20 times the mass of a proton. Another way that we look for dark matter annihilations is using the AMS detector on the International Space Station. AMS is designed to detect a variety of kinds of cosmic rays, and in particular, we're excited about AMS looking for cosmic ray antiprotons, um, the antimatter counterpart of protons. Now, these are pretty rare in, in among cosmic rays, like one, one in 10 to the four protons is an antiproton in the cosmic ray spectrum. But dark matter annihilating should make equal numbers of protons and antiprotons. So if you observe more antiprotons than you can explain by other means, you might think that's because dark matter was annihilating in our part of the Milky Way halo. So after the AMS detector and the CMB, a third way to look for the remnants of dark matter annihilation is through gamma ray telescopes. And this turns out to be pretty promising. I'm particularly fond of a telescope called Fermi or the Fermi Space Based Gamma Ray Telescope. Uh, Fermi's been in orbit now for about 12 years, uh, looking at the whole sky, measuring uh, gamma rays from all directions with energies between about 100 MeV and uh, a TeV or so. And uh, they can look for dark matter annihilations uh, in a variety of different ways. They can look for dark matter annihilating in things called dwarf galaxies, which are small satellite galaxies orbiting the Milky Way. We also look for signs of dark matter annihilation with Fermi by looking at the, the uh, kind of isotropic gamma ray background, the light coming from the whole universe in all directions. And uh, my favorite way to use Fermi to look for dark matter is to look at the galactic center, the uh, few thousand light years in the innermost part of the Milky Way. This is where we think the dark matter density will be highest in our corner of the universe and therefore the most annihilations would be going on there. And uh, that could potentially produce a really bright signal. And um, back in 2009, I did some work with uh, Lisa Goodenough, who was a grad student at the time. And uh, Lisa and I had found in the Fermi data a pretty bright signal that looked like dark matter annihilation products coming from the Galactic Center. There's been uh, you know more than a decade now of arguing and debating back and forth, but. I, these days, I think it's pretty likely that we're actually looking at dark matter in that signal. Certainly, we don't know for sure. And by all means, this is controversial. You shouldn't believe me. You should listen to a lot of people make up your own mind. So if you can't tell, Dan is really excited about the Galactic Center Gamma Ray Excess. But it's far from being confirmed, so don't go ahead and tell your family and friends that we've detected dark matter yet. And with that, let's move on to the third way that WIMPs would interact with matter, and that's through production. Direct and indirect detection take advantage of the dark matter that already exists in the universe. Either you're trying to observe those particles smashing against nuclei in your detector, or you're trying to observe the uh, annihilation products that are produced when those particles annihilate. The third way doesn't do this at all. Instead of trying to observe the dark matter that's already out there in the universe, we try to create new particles of dark matter in the laboratory. And here I have in mind uh, experiments like the Large Hadron Collider and other particle accelerators. So because of Einstein's equation equals mc squared, if you put enough energy in one place at one time, you can make particles with a lot of mass, including potentially dark matter particles. So we take two protons, we accelerate them to nearly the speed of light at the Large Hadron Collider, we smash them together, and suddenly we have about 13 tera electron volts of energy in one place at one time. And it's possible we could produce pairs of dark matter particles that will fly out of that, that, that collision. Now you don't detect the dark matter itself for the same reason we can't see it with telescopes very easily. We can't see it in these, these collisions. But if you have a collision and you see two protons come in and, and all of the energy that comes out 
pushes in one direction and nothing in the other direction, you know from momentum conservation that something must have come out that other direction. And if you have enough of these collisions and enough data and, and enough, uh, enough uh, of, of these collisions have this sort of feature, you could potentially deduce that there was in fact a new kind of species of particle being produced in these collisions and you could measure its mass and other sorts of characteristics. So that wraps up the three kinds of experiments we've built to search for WIMPs. And with the potential exception of the Galactic Center Gamma Ray Excess, none of these experiments have detected dark matter. And this is surprising, at least to me and to a lot of my colleagues. Um, if dark matter really did consist of WIMPs, then these are the sorts of experiments that should be sensitive to it. Um, you know, it's not impossible that a WIMP could remain hidden, but if you wrote down all of the WIMP theories that anybody's ever considered, uh, you know, and, and started just doing an accounting, you'd find a pretty large fraction of those we should have seen already. So can I ask, Dan, if you had to go back into the mindset uh, of that video of you from 2007, what would be your new predictions for dark matter searches in the future? Well, I'm not quite as uh, optimistic as I was in 2007, but I'm still pretty optimistic. Um, in the next decade or so, these underground detection experiments are going to get you know, quite a bit more sensitive. There's no reason to think they won't succeed. And they're testing a long list of really exciting theories. And every, every year these experiments get more sensitive and, and teach us things we didn't previously know. At the same time, um, I think the Galactic Center Gamma Ray Access is really compelling. And um, as we study that and scrutinize it more and, 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 and look at that signal in more uh, in different and more powerful ways, it may become increasingly clear to, to more people that that's, that's a, a authentic signal of dark matter. The Large Hadron Collider is going to have various kinds of upgrades. It's going to have a high luminosity upgrade in the, in the future, for example, which will allow us to study a much larger number of collisions than we've currently been able to study. All of these things are exciting. And taken together, I think it's uh, not unlikely, let's say that, I'll, I'll choose my words carefully, it's not unlikely that we will learn dark matter as identity in the years or decade or something. This episode was produced and edited by me, Shalma Wegsman. Research and writing is done by Dan Hooper and I. Dan is a theoretical physicist at Fermilab and the University of Chicago, and is the author of many books, including most recently, At the Edge of Time, Exploring the Mysteries of Our Universe's First Second. All music in Why This Universe is produced by Jake Kleinbaum. Thank you so much for your support and for listening, and we hope you tune in next time to Why This Universe.